Sean Bailey, hot off the Conservative Party conference stage. You've just made your speech. How did it go? I think it went well. Nobody threw anything at me. I got a stand innovation at the end, so that's, that, I, I take that as a metric. It went well. Announcements. What did you say? What have you announced? I think for me, what I was reiterating is what I see as the, the priorities in London, as Londoners have told me. In the last year or so, I have been all over the piece, just speaking to people, speaking to people on what I call a listening exercise. And I, always, I just want to come back to conference and say, look, here is what people in London are speaking about and told them. I, I talk about crime a lot because for me it's a, it's a social mobility issue. If you come from where I come from, depending on your orientation to crime, are you in a local gang? Is a local gang pursuing you? Do you go to school with people who think they're gangster number one? That determines if you're going to bother to get anything done. So I talk about that and then I went on to talk about housing because everybody needs housing from people in social right up to people who are renting, paying more rent than they would in mortgage, if you know what I mean. So that's really important to me as well. But ultimately, it's just making a London that actually works. You do not wake up in the morning thinking, what's the mayor of London doing? And you shouldn't need to either. And that's the kind of London I want to run. People will talk about crime in London, particularly serious youth violence, and they will say that it's a combination of a number of things. They might talk about expulsions from school, they might talk about domestic violence or austerity, reduction in youth services, something that you can probably talk about very explicitly. So you look at London, you look at rising crime, what do you see as the main causes of it? There is no one main cause, everything is in it, but there's a couple of main ways to stop it. What I've been trying to say to people, there's a hard and a soft response in there. And the hard response is more police on the road, a thing I'm calling scan and search. Halfway down that spectrum is what I want to do is call Operation London Ceasefire to get people who are heavily involved and say, look, we're going to give you an opportunity to make a choice. We're going to give you support, give you access to work, careers advice, whatever it is to bring you away from that life. And right at the other end is the youth zones I want to build. I've already looked into the policy, the money's there, I've found a partner. That's the way you address crime. There's other things as well about what messages you send. I remember watching the Lib Dem conference and them saying they won't um, prosecute people for carrying acid and knives. I cannot tell you what madness that is. That is so far away from the reality of the streets that I know anyway. And that's why I'm saying to people I would prosecute those things because you want to you make it less likely that you come across someone you know, with those weapons on their person, if you see what I mean. And my big thing is to de-escalate the tension, but also raise the level of expectation and access for people, particularly young people. What's scan and search? So scan and search is just a bit of technology you buy for the police. So currently, if I stop you, I have to physically stop you and ask you to turn out your pockets. There is technology that could scan you from away and see what's in your pocket. And if it's something out of order, I'll come over there. And I think at that point, the police do have the right to stop you if you are armed. And if you haven't got anything in your pocket, on your way. And what it means is we can scan many more people with much more rights so cause less hassle. I think another um, aspect of that is also I would ask the police to do really different training about who they stop and search and how they do it as well as part of that package. So the thing that the main criticism that's levelled at stop and search is that it disproportionately affects young black men in particular in central London. And in fact actually there's been studies that show very little correlation between effective use and stop and search and reduction in crime. So why are you going to be pursuing it in this way? Because as you can imagine, as a young black man myself, I'm particularly sensitive to being stopped and searched. That's why I'm saying this is effectively the search without the stop. And any stop you'd need to do would be justified because you, you, you had a weapon. You're, you're beyond the, I thought you had, or suspicious, or you fit the description. No, I can see that you have a weapon in your pocket. Show me said weapon. Very different relationship that people would generate with the police. This is a serious breach of people's right to privacy though, isn't it? Scanning people as they walk down the street? No, because you do it in particular areas. So take King's Cross, one of the busiest areas in, in London, right? I think we have a right to just check in an area like that if somebody has um, a weapon on them. And, and I'll give you a full why. So a little while ago, I, I met a lady called Michelle McWilliams, whose son JJ was stabbed to death. He's such a good guy, he was stopping a fight. JJ shouldn't be dead. He simply shouldn't be dead. Uh, Ten years ago, I was doing youth work, uh, working with a guy called Marvin, just like, you know, one of those kids, full of life, cheeky, you know what I mean, getting on really well, yeah? Talked to him one day, next day he's not around, why? He's been murdered. These are the things that I want to stop. I can't... <sighs> I, I come from the community that this happens to the most, so I've got to do something about it. Do you know what I mean? I've just got to. People will hear you saying that and they'll, pro they'll probably agree with you, they want to stop those murders, but they'll probably throw back at you that it's the Conservative Party that has reduced the number of police on the streets, it's the Conservative Party that's closed a huge number of youth centres. I mean, I think it's, 
youth, youth, um, youth frontline youth services, their council budgets have been slashed by half since 2010. How, I mean, how do you answer that criticism? I think there's two things. Is we could play the blame game because I could talk about it was a Labour government that bankrupted the, the public finances. Remember, the Chief Secretary to Treasurer, Treasury, who's a Labour um, um, member, left a note saying we've spent all the money. That's, what, that's why we're in that situation. But what it is for me, I want to concentrate on what we can do now. And there's a couple of things you have to do if you're going to address crime. First, you have to say, I will take you on. If you're a criminal, it's you versus the mayor. Let's get it done. And that's why I'm saying, when you have a mayor who says it will take 10 years, you're giving permission for people to carry weapons. When you hear a mayor say, being part and, part, part, part and parcel of living in the big cities that you have terror attacks, I just don't think that's right. I think you've got to stand up and get into it with, with, with the elements, and I would do that. It's one thing to, to use that kind of language, but is there, is, is there any evidence to suggest that being harsh on crime can actually, you know, let's talk about tougher sentences or, you know, more forceful policing. Have you got any evidence you can point to that would show that, that actually reduce, reduces crime rate? Because, you know, for example, Dr. Baz Dreisinger, she's done a study, she looked at penal systems all across the world, and she couldn't see any correlation between tougher sentencing and a reduction in, in crime level. So, so what can you point to to substantiate your claim? There's two things. This isn't about tougher policing. This is about much more effective policing. And the second thing, where a sentence matters is because of rehabilitation. One of the worst things you start to realise as a youth worker, you get a kid, 15, 16, get a few cautions, not take it seriously, bang, he's in jail all of a sudden, yeah? He goes to jail, you know, he's cheeky, he, he, I could turn him round with, with a bit of contact with youth work, comes back hardened criminal. Now, we have to make sure we give appropriate sentences. That's why I've talked about if it's a low level of um, offence, if, if it's not a violent crime, do we actually have to put that person away? What are we doing to ourselves and that young person? But if it is a serious crime and they do go away, they should serve the sentence so we have the time to help them rehabilitate. When I ran my job club, I dealt with lots of people who'd been inside. That was kind of, I don't want to say it was our speciality, but the nature of where we were, it happened a lot. And I could tell straight away if someone had, had, had enough work done on them to rehabilitate them to go to work and then if they didn't we didn't have to try to do it but you need the time and plus if the public are going to trust in the law and the criminal justice system it has to be seen as some level of justice for the victims and i think a lot of the the conversation we have now has lost the idea that, that there's any victim and believe you me if you're talking about serious violence there is always a victim what about the public health approach what do you think of that this is part of it you, you Here's what I say about the public health. Everybody's focusing on Glasgow, but let's be clear, Glasgow is a tiny place. It's probably two London boroughs at, at best. Also, they don't have the racial issues that we had. And I don't even mean, you know, racism. I mean the fact that they were all from one community, had a shared history, there's an easy liaison going on there, that kind of stuff. And when people talk about the public health um, approach. They, they talk about like it hasn't been going on. Well, I've been a youth worker for over 20 years. I have one to ask those people, what do, they think, what do they think I was doing? What do they think social services is doing? What do they think prison, um, people in prison who, who reform people are trying to do, educate, etc.? What do they think they're trying to do? I think here right now, the public health approach means better liaison amongst those people. And I do welcome the term because I think it, 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 it sets a, a culture that people are willing to try and help people with agencies outside of their own, which I think is, is very powerful. But a public health approach only works if you have the stick at one end and the carrot at the other. And anybody who spent any time asking Glasgow how they achieved the, the results they did, they will tell you we had both elements, stick and carrot. But they also looked at treating causes instead of symptoms. I mean, you can say that Glasgow is a much smaller city, but mm -hmm. that same approach has been adopted in Boston and mm -hmm. Cincinnati. Those, those cities are much more comparable to London in terms Still of scale. Still much smaller. But, but this isn't about scale, because obviously London is also has a larger police force, more social services. Mm -hmm. Let's get this straight. I consider myself having been working on a public health approach for over 20 years. So do I support it? My, my, my pushback would be, why is it taking so long for everybody else to catch up? That's mm. the first thing. And of course you do it, because any, anything that is societal needs a long-term approach that deals with the symptoms. That's why you'll always hear me talk about work. You'll always hear me talk about family, and you'll always hear me talk about community. Because for me, the people who came from my community who did well stood as much chance of doing as doing doing badly but it's those three elements that pulled them over either because they benefited from those three elements or they got involved in delivering one of those three elements and that's why for me i don't need to be challenged with a public health approach all i need to do is figure out how i can help more agencies be involved and be more effective it's commendable that you would view yourself as having worked on it for this long period of time but i still feel like the criticism that the conservative party government 
has cut youth services. Look, I'm just using that as an example because you used to work in it. You know, that, those budgets by half. How can you say that the public health approach is being used when those services are being reduced? It, there's two things. If you really want to go down the route of services, I make my point about wh who did what with, with, with the money. I, I think that's an important thing. People focus on the past. Like I said, I want to focus on the future, but that, I think that has to be part of the conversation if you're going, going to say that. It's easy to say that if it's part of the Conservative Party's past. But, but, it then, but it's easy for you to say it to me. What I'm trying to say is you won't hear me wriggling. I remember when I was in number 10, right, I was saying to them, don't take the money it may have a consequence. And their pushback was always, well, well, as soon as you tell us where we can get the money from, we won't take the money. And it was as simple as that. And I've spent all of my life scratching around, believe you me, trying to raise the money. I've run football clubs, I've run girls groups, I've done all manner of things. So I know what it is to get the money. But if, you, if people are gonna attack you about the money going away, they have to be fair and ask about who took the money away, where did it go? And what's interesting now is that through the activities of all manner of people, this government is now beginning to address those situations and trying to put back that money. But like my mum says, you can't spend money you don't have. It's the, you know, the stick that's used is the magic money tree, mm -hmm. but still money was found to do a deal with the DUP, a tax break for the highest earners. I think if we're talking about violent crime, I personally, and I'm sure a lot of other Londoners would probably agree with me, that they would have liked to have seen those things perhaps not being prioritised over reduction in youth services or police officers. I, I also would have given, that, given, the, um, given the money to other things, but then you have to ask yourself questions like this. All parties make, make choices. So for instance, look at TfL, they've had a doubling in their union hours. I would have given that money to policing. I wrote a plan for the Mayor of London that would have given him 83 million extra pounds to spend on policing or anything else. He chose not to do that. So the, the spending priorities any group makes, I don't think anybody in, 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 in politics in power now can hold their hand up and act like they're some paragon of virtue when there's other things they could have done and they equally didn't do them. Uh, somebody said this to me about Sadiq Khan. I said, let's be clear, Sadiq Khan was a minister in the government that caused that financial situation. So let's, if we're gonna point fingers, let's make sure everybody gets their fair share of the finger pointing. Just to be clear, you're not attributing the, f the global financial crash to the Labour government? No, 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 I'm talking about the overspending okay, of the Labour sure, government. I, sure. That they absolutely, you know, have had their hands on a tiller, if you know what I mean. So in terms of Sadiq Khan, he's backed a public health approach, copying the work of the Violence Reduction Unit in Glasgow. What is it that's wrong about his approach that you would change? There's two things. Firstly, he didn't back it. He was dragged to the table. Let's be clear about it. He was very slow to make a move. A number of organisations in London pushed and pushed and pushed, and he reluctantly did that. I think the second thing as well is he hasn't shown any leadership. He gave them the money and didn't have any idea what he wanted them to do. I would have been much more... Um, focused on my outcomes, not just the fact I could release a press release with, with, with a big figure in it. Secondly, uh, thirdly, sorry, and I think the real big mistake, he put it inside City Hall. I think that approach, that large amount of money would have been much more powerful in the voluntary sector, much more powerful independently. As Mayor of London, as anyone in, with political power, you do need to be challenged. The Violence Reduction Unit literally in their job contracts they will not be able to challenge the mayor of london because they work for him I, there's a number of serious organizations in london who could have made real real hay with such a huge amount of money so you've just as mentioned earlier come mm -hmm. off the stage you made your speech your plan for how you want to tackle crime in london and various other things mm -hmm. Big policy announcements, as has been the story all week, and yet the country's newspapers are focused on allegations about Boris Johnson. There's been an allegation from the journalist Charlotte Edwards that he groped her, he grabbed her in a thigh without her consent, which he strenuously denies. Mm -hmm. how, how damaging do you think these stories are to the Conservative Party and to Boris Johnson? I think they're damaging to all of us. I to anybody in politics, because politics now is so based on personal attacks, trying to undermine your opponent. I remember um, Jeremy Corbyn's office got in trouble for a training course that titled uh, How to Undermine Your Opponent. I spoke to a, a woman earlier on today who's not a Conservative supporter, but fortunately for me has decided to support me. And she said, these attacks are so regular, she no longer believes nobody. Yeah, and, and I think that's actually quite damaging because that spills into do people believe the policy announcements which you make, et cetera, et cetera. And, and, and I, I think for me, it seems a bit conveniently timed for, for a Conservative Party conference, and that again puts a shadow over it. But I just wish we could concentrate on what makes a difference to people's lives. Like since we've been here, four people have been stabbed to death. Someone in my old stomping grounds, that's what I'm focused on. I just want to get on with my life. And I think for most people, they'll hear this kind of news and they'll either be for it or against it, but 
everybody will think, why are we even talking about this? We've got to answer Brexit, we've got to answer how we're going to fund this, how we're going to do that. And that's what people want to focus on, I believe. Sure. Criminality. And if someone's making an allegation of criminality about the Prime Minister, that's quite serious, is it not? Any, any allegation about anybody is, is, is serious in one sense and not in another. And I think the nature of the allegation and when and how it's made adds to that. But if it's a criminal allegation, fair enough, let the police have a look at if that's what needs to be done. So, on the one hand, we have a journalist of record, very high standing in Westminster, Charlotte Edwards, one of the best, I would say, in, in the trade. She makes this allegation and she makes it about our Prime Minister who himself has actually been, he denies it, we should say that again, mm -hmm. he denies it, but he has actually been fired from two of his jobs for lying in the past. Your response to that is, it's conveniently timed? Do you not think you should look at it a little bit more seriously? No. My response to that is, I've had conversations with people who've said it's been convenient in time. My response to that is, let's ask all politicians the same questions, you know, everybody, it is in this it is in this murky world and that's the problem isn't it if you run a political system that's based on undermining your opponent you'll forever have dirty conversations and never actually get the compromise to be clear I see politics as the art of the possible. I see it as something that you have to compromise. I see it as you have to have the ability to represent people who don't quite have the same beliefs as you. Having these kind of conversations, I don't think helps. Now, if there's an allegation and it's true or not, if it wants an investigation, let's just have the investigation. Do you think that policy of compromise can be applied to what you just said about Sadiq Khan and having to be dragged to the table to adopt the public health approach? Well, I wouldn't have had to be dragged so hard, is what I'm saying. Someone would have made the suggestion to me, and I would have given a straight answer, yes or no. Um, I would have looked into it. What, one of the most pleasurable things about the state I'm in now, and I mean running around campaigning, is I'm on a listening exercise, and I tell you what, you can learn an awful lot. There is, I have not come across any subject that there isn't a group of people in London that are given serious thought to, real serious thought. And that's my sort of... I'd hope permanent state to, learn, to listen and learn. Don't get me wrong, you can't do everything and please everyone. But if this idea is so great that it warrants <clears throat> 5.8 million, then you shouldn't need to be dragged to the table in the first place. Will you be taking that approach then into the London mayoral race, one of compromise, one of dialogue, rather than one that attacks Sadiq Khan? I really, really intend to. I won't lie, I'm only human, I'm not perfect. When you're constantly attacked, right, um, you know, I'm a geezer, innit? I'm a bird. No, I didn't mean to say I'm a player. If you're constantly attacked at some point, you might lose your rag. And what's interesting is Sadiq and his bunch have decided they'll, they'll try and upset me and attack me. They just don't know where I'm coming from. I, I've been in situations far more threatening than Sadiq is, is capable of, so it's for, I'd be fine. I'm going to try, and I think I will make it, just to do politics rather than do personal attacks. It's just, it's just tedious. It's just tedious. Sean Bailey, thank you so much for taking the time. Great to see you. Great to see you.